And we are now recording. Welcome to the CTSC webinar for July 24th, 2017. I'm your host, Jeanette Dopheide. CTSC is the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, and these webinars are part of its mission to deliver high-quality, actionable guidance regarding cybersecurity to the NSF community. More information about CTSC can be found at trustedci.org. Today's topic is Inaugural Security Program at Internet2 with Internet2's Paul Howell. Before we begin, I have a few items to note. First, this presentation is being recorded. Second, participants are welcome to ask questions during the session using the chat box in the Adobe Connect window, just like we did earlier. And we will accept questions after uh, the presentation as well. And with that, I will hand off the microphone to Paul Howell. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and thank you for giving me a chance to present to you this morning. Um, thank you. Let me do the, I, I, I can, I went to the next slide, so clearly Jeanette's uh, tutelage of me on how to operate Adobe Connect was successful. So, um, so this is uh, really about putting in place a security program at Internet2. And, uh, I, you know, I think pretty much everyone in the community has been aware of Internet2 since its formation. Uh, it's been a great uh, collaboration vehicle for a number of, of important activities, uh, some of which really couldn't have been done without bringing together people from the community in an organized way to solve a, a problem that we had. So the, the network, as you know, has been in place uh, from almost the, the beginning. It's seen as one of the sort of core competencies of, of Internet2. And over the years, Internet2 and staff have been involved in security uh, and have facilitated a number of, of activities in the security space. I recall when I was at the uh, University of Michigan, being a member of SALSA, the Security at Line Speed uh, uh, group, and uh, this was how, how campuses and other sort of large infrastructure networks might tackle some of the unique challenges of security in, in those environments. Um, so when, um, and, and so this talk is a little different, and so I'll just start, start uh, moving on here to the next. Slide. This is really about uh, the inaugural program here at Internet2 for protecting the network. So sort of the history of this is sometime in 2013, uh, leadership here at Internet2 as well as its board of trustees, you know, sort of were aware of the increasing sophisticated threats the campuses were facing. And, uh, you know, most of the Board of Trustee members are either CIOs or presidents of universities. And as they uh, realized that more and more of their mission-critical network traffic was flowing across Internet2 for various uh, cloud services uh, as well as research between each other, and they realized, or they began to ask, I should say, so what's Internet2 doing relative to security? And really there hadn't been, uh, up to that point anyways, a concerted effort to put in place a uh, sort of a broad-based security program for the network. So um, the, the idea was that, that, that they would establish a role that would essentially evaluate the security posture, present to leadership some of, uh, some of the recommendations uh, from, from sort of a best common practice uh, mindset, and then uh, with leadership's uh, uh, blessing go forward. Um, it's, it's interesting to note that, that you know, most of the NRENs that I've worked with, so I used to work at Merit for, for several years, and while we uh, worked we, we had some security offerings. We didn't necessarily have a, a security program focused on the network. And, and um, uh, in, in the time I've been at Internet2 now, which is about three years, um, several NRENs do a, a fairly nice job of security. They have dedicated staff and uh, uh, 
uh, you know, ha have resources devoted to security. Others uh, sort of are, uh, I would say, not quite there yet in terms of having a security program. So it's a very uh, mixed field. Uh, when you go, go below into to sort of the, the higher education uh, you know, members, the universities and so on, it's, it's fairly common today for universities to have some dedicated security effort, and most of the top R1s have formal security programs. So uh, it was clear that there was a need to create a, an environment in which people using the network, organizations using the network, felt as if it was, it was uh, well protected. So just a little bit about uh, the security uh, mission and approach and the team that we have in place. So, um, you know, in the last couple of years, this is the mission statement that we've come up for our team. Um, and that is uh, around protecting uh, the network. Uh, we try to use the, the common security terms, uh, CIA, the confidentiality, integrity, availability, with the note of appropriate confidentiality for the national uh, research and education uh, network. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of funny in a sense, I, so I was the inaugural security officer at Michigan in 2004 and, you know, worked there for 10 years uh, install, installing and leading a security program. And there it was, there was a lot of sensitive information. It was both uh, moving around as well as at rest. Um, you know, for our environment here in the network, uh, it's almost all about information uh, that's moving around and, it's, and almost none of it is our information. So it's, it's critical that, you know, what we do from a mission in terms of protecting the network is to ensure that it's trustworthy, it's reliant, reliable, and also the information is uh, protected as best as we can protect it. And obviously the organization sending and receiving information have to take steps as well to protect that information. So the, uh, you know, the approach is to, to of course, work with uh, a leadership, and I'll get more into that, into how we do that uh, a little later, uh, but also to work with the other networks, the connectors and regionals that are part of this broader uh, NREN community that we have here in the, in the United States and see it as, a, as almost an ecosystem and how can we work collectively uh, to, to uh, protect ourselves and our members. We have a great team, um, and uh, this is one of the elements that, quite uh, frankly, I'm most uh, pleased and, and, if I can even say, proud of, uh, and that is that Internet2 has been willing to devote some resources to security. Uh, Carl Newell comes to us from the University of Arizona, uh, very technically uh, sound. I think if some, any of you worked on the recent uh, DDoS mitigation project, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, as well. Uh, he was our technical lead on that, and uh, uh, Ryan Nobriga leads our analytics uh, area. He's kind of a good mix of a network engineer, system engineer, and uh, comes to us from CEN, many years of working there. And Grover Browning, uh, who I'm sure many of you know, been around Indiana University for quite a while and has been involved with uh, uh, Internet2 as well for, for a long time and also been a, a senior architect of uh, an engineer of networks. So, so it's a great group of, of people. Um, just to kind of set the stage, when I think of a comprehensive security program, this is just sort of a, a way I like to, to describe it and present uh, what, what I'm thinking. And that is that there are various uh, components to a program uh, that, that um, need to be in place in order, for, uh, in order for an organization to be able to work, a, a secu work security as essentially a process. So having policy uh, and uh, putting in place the necessary uh, documents that guide you both in terms of procedures and, and, and uh, you know, govern sort of staff thinking on, on approaches to security, 
and articulate our position. Those are, uh, those are critical. Uh, risk management, which I'll, I'll go into as well, is sort of an approach I've used over the years and many in security have uh, to evaluate uh, threats and to propose uh, countermeasures to those threats, to solutions. Um, incident management, something that we all have to do. Uh, and in fact, I've even got a little example of an incident that we encountered recently in our network, but it was good to have incident management procedures in place because it gave us a chance to work through an incident, albeit a very minor one. Um, and then there's sort of the technical security component of security, which I think a lot of people think of as primarily what security does. These are the firewalls, the you know, two-factor authentication, uh, you know, intrusion detection, those sorts of things. And you know, they're all, that's important. Uh, some of those things, the security team doesn't actually operate. Uh, you know, we may rely on other operational teams to run those systems, uh, but then there are some things that we, we do operate. And then education and awareness activities, and I'll touch on that a little bit as well in terms of what we've done. So uh, here's a, a security program maturity model that's borrowed essentially from Gartner uh, that also uh, others are, have used uh, over the years that I think is sort of indicative of, of how you think about moving from, from one stage of a security program, say, to the next stage, and what might be in front of you in terms of what you're aiming for. Um, clearly, when I began at Internet 2 three years ago, uh, it was, at least from, from a network services standpoint, was clearly at level one initial. Uh, there was some initial awareness from executives. They, they knew that security was an issue. They weren't sure just what risks there were. Um, they weren't sure uh, what was actually being done around protecting uh, the network. Uh, there were, were no security policies at that time. Uh, and there was no real visibility into, into risks. So very little was, was known. It was very much at a, at a technical level. So with, the, with my role and, I'll, and, and with the performance of a uh, broad-based security uh, risk assessment, uh, the result of that, which I'll discuss later as well, talking about the improvements that we made, we've been able to sort of move over this three-year period to more of a, a beginning level three defined. So uh, we, we've, we've sort of transitioned or are transitioning from level two developing where we have policy, we have a charter, we've assessed our current state, we have a program uh, initiated to a point now where uh, we're, we're doing annual risk assessments. Uh, we, are cl we have closed most of the critical gaps and there's a couple uh, gaps that we're still working on uh, and I'll discuss those as well. But we have procedures defined and so on. Um, really, in terms of where the network services group should be relative to this national uh, resource, you know, my proposal has been to move it into sort of uh, the level four managed and, and think of that as being the place we need to uh, ultimately reside. Uh, the kind of effort and resource and, and uh, um, you know, work it's going to take to continue to optimize the program uh, doesn't really fit the mission of Internet 2. And so it's clear that we want to have some lines of business engaged in security. We want to have executive level reporting um, uh, and, and some effective metrics. And I, I think that's probably good enough for where Internet 2 is going to end up. So Risk management, you know, the term is thrown around quite a bit. It means probably different things to different people. Um, uh, this is a, a chart I've used over the years, uh, uh, both at, at Michigan and as well as in some uh, presentation scenarios. And, and I've, I've been reusing it here at Internet, too. Uh, it tries to, I think, depict a, a, a cycle a broad based cycle to, to risk management that, that I uh, in, in, uh, operate from. And, I, um, and so the, the idea here is that 
that you know at some point you're you're assessing risk, and so that is to say you're prioritizing risks. You're ga you've gathered data. You're prioritizing those risks, and you're then moving into some decision support uh, realm. And and the reason that this is important is that it it is a realm in which really uh, has to be engaged with by with leadership. You can't do it sort of unilaterally on your own. This is an area that requires um, executive teams and those truly accountable to be involved because they're going to de decide whether or not they accept the risk that's been uh, described to them or whether they're going to, uh, in essence, mitigate that risk through accepting some recommendations that may have been put forward to do so. Uh, sometimes I guess you have an opportunity to transfer risk if, if that's a, a, you know, uh, available to engage a third party. Uh, most of the work that we've done here, transference of risk has really not come up as an option though. Um, and then the idea is to, to implement those controls, uh, seeking a holistic approach. Uh, you know, this is some, you know, this process sometimes is referred to, I think, as uh, you know, the mindset of defense in depth. Some people like that, some people don't. I, I kind of think of it as uh, you know, multiple layers and, and sort of trying to guard against single points of failure. Um, and then it's important that you measure the effectiveness. And I'll show you, um, you know, what we're doing. I wouldn't say we've, we've done well at measuring the effectiveness of those controls uh, yet. I think that's still on the horizon for us. Um, in fact, we'll probably, we've been doing risk assessments, but a very tightly scoped areas, and we haven't done the sort of broad-based uh, assessment of the entire network um, since three years ago. And so we probably won't for another year or so. But it's important that we pay some attention to those things in, in the metrics piece. So that's kind of where we are in this broad cycle. Uh Hi, Paul, one second. Um, uh, Dean was ha kind of asking a general question to the group. Uh, anyone else have a formal scorecard or specific metrics they've documented and are willing to share? Um, and I'll go back on mute and um, we can go back and look at that. Uh, but uh, please proceed. Okay. Yeah, great question. If you do, please uh, please share it. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, benefits of risk, uh, risk this risk management approach. There are many. In my mind, this is what I put forward to Internet Two leadership when I said why we're doing this. And I, I should say that this broad-based assessment that we conducted uh, was not a small undertaking. It took us a couple of months to work through all of the facets uh, of it. So it's important to understand what the value of doing that is. So, um, you know, I try to, to describe it in terms of uh, it's the kind of baseline work, the digging into the details that's going to make it possible to present to leadership just what the situation is. Um, probably one of the, the, you know, sort of critical outcomes of all of this is creating a climate uh, or a culture really of security. You know, by asking key questions, by examining uh, production services and configurations of, of devices and processes of operational processes, looking at them from a security standpoint, you, you develop a sense of what, uh, you know, you try to get a more of a security mindset going uh, across the, the organization. Uh, Internet 2 doesn't have a lot of regulatory compliance issues, but but certainly um, uh, risk assessments are useful for that. Uh, you know, operating at, a, at an effective and, and appropriate level of risk is, is uh, critical. And, you know, being able to sort of move the organization to a more proactive risk posture so that you're looking at your investments in security, you can measure where you're having some impact, and hopefully security incidents themselves are fairly minor and, uh, uh, and well managed. 
So the assessment that um, I like to use, um, and this is not something you know unique to me. I think uh, if you're, I've been a longtime Educause uh, uh, member, and uh, within some of the security circles and Educause, these are common approaches for or risk assessments by those universities uh, doing them. But the idea is we used uh, uh, a control catalog referred to as NIST 853. Um, it had about 268 questions. And, and it was that uh, going through th that control catalog that took the most time for us. Um, we also did, though, technical interviews of uh, various network and system uh, engineers working on the network. You know, these control questions don't touch on every facet of, of a technology, and so it was important to, to do some additional uh, uh, uncovering of, of how things are, are operated. And then we, we looked at logs, policies, we visited co-location sites, um, and uh, met with different groups, both uh, Level 3 and Internet 2 Knox. All of that information then was brought together and, and a threat matrix had been identified. Uh, vulnerabilities were listed um, and, and using sort of an approach of which are the most serious, uh, there were corrective actions uh, proposed for each risk. And I'll list the actions here in a minute. And um, you know, as I say, that went to leadership uh, here for decisions, and then we began implement, implementation of those improvements. Um, just a quick note, when I work with security teams that are fairly uh, junior, I suppose, or uh, almost inexperienced with this process or with the risk assessment approach, they seem to stumble on presenting findings to leadership. Um, you know, this, this is, it's not a science for sure, but it, but it is important and it's, and it's more art. It's a way of describing risk because really most of the improvements required um, you know, ha have a resource ask that come with them. So uh, it's important for, for directors, uh, CEOs in the case of Internet2, the Board of Trustees, to be able to uh, approve those resource requests. So uh, the assessment, I began in July of 14. The assessment was completed with, uh, in, in February of 15. And uh, that included several draft cycles where we cycled uh, drafts of the report to various operational teams for comment. Um, I didn't list that here, but that's often a, a critical element is, is to make sure that operational teams that are, that are running the environment that's being assessed understand what the assessment says before you take it forward to other groups. Um, now, they may not agree with everything, and in fact, I'll be perfectly uh, candid. In our case, they didn't agree with everything, but that's okay. Uh, that doesn't, they don't have to. Um, and so, uh, but it was good that they understood where, what was going to be said. Um, these kinds of initial assessments oftentimes find gaps, and, and this was no, uh, no different. So there were a number of, of gaps in the environment, and, and that really just stems from the fact that there really hadn't been a broad-based, holistic look at the environment to, to see, you know, what lined up and what didn't. So the, the improvements fell basically into two categories, short term, which we thought were relatively uh, urgent, uh, and then longer term, which had to do with either establishing the foundations of the program or there were major projects that depended on the short term uh, improvements being completed. So one of the things we sort of immediately ran into was, and this was just how uh, how our, how our network operations center was organized, um, they were, they had people assigned, uh, they had assigned administrative rights to people uh, that weren't working on our network just in case they were needed to through some, you know, vacation or sickness or someone else who was a regular uh, uh, staff person working on the network, if, if that person was unavailable 
then someone else in the group could just jump in. But of course, you know, all those administrative privileges meant then that there were more people who were potential victims of phishing and all the other bad things that can happen. So um, we were able to reduce the number uh, significantly down to under 30 that would actually have read-write access to the network and then put in place some emergency provisioning uh, process. Um, like many networks in higher ed, uh, the notion of a jump host uh, used to access devices in the network was in place here. That jump host relied upon two-factor, uh, but the devices themselves that were being logged into did not. And this was probably one of the more contentious areas with operations engineers. They felt that, it, that the network itself was then protected by two-factor. Yet, you know, when you see attacks that are successful, if there's an in initial perimeter that's breached, being able to move laterally within a network uh, by an attacker, if that's easy, uh, it'll certainly happen. And so our view was that if an attacker was able to get into a router, they could get to any other uh, routers, switches, controllers, whatever, because those were just reusable passwords. So uh, we overcame that, and we put in two-factor on all the routers and switches and everything. Um, we ran into a situation where there was some operationally sensitive information in, that was publicized by Internet2. So as near as I can tell, within the higher ed community, most NRENs don't publish internal operating information to the degree that uh, Internet2 does. And so I'm referring to things like looking glass kinds of uh, views into a network. Um, Internet2 provided both router proxy and something else referred to as visible network. Uh, and those, went, those, those exposed far more information than any of the, the regional networks I've seen or even other global NRENs. That information was really, uh, we viewed it as targeting information. So these were IP addresses of various infrastructure, such as AAA servers used to support the network. And we just didn't see a need to have those published. Uh, it might give an attacker some uh, opportunity to target those devices. So those were, were redacted. Um, and we, you know, in doing so, we worked with a, a, group, a community group uh, of network engineers throughout the, uh, throughout the regionals to make sure that we weren't removing anything that would truly be uh, needed. Um, one of the things that I, I, I thought was really fascinating was the fact that in-band management uh, was being performed in-band with the, the data itself that the network was passing. And, and you know, clearly a security, from a security standpoint, if you're trying to protect um, an, an environment, uh, one of the, the, the standard tools you have is to segment the network that that environment uh, utilizes. And I, and I know that we've all been there uh, with various uh, in, you know, systems that deal with credit cards or other sensitive information. You create out-of-band networks or essentially segmented networks for those, uh, those areas. You know, this is sort of the famous DMZ uh, concept. So uh, we proposed a more of an out-of-band management network that would have access to the entire management plane for us and all of our telemetry that we could control those assets perhaps uh, more appropriately. The security team uh, I mentioned and then just developing operational capabilities. Uh, one of the things we ran into quickly was that our, the, all the devices uh, generated syslog, volumes of syslog, and the syslogs were being analyzed for operational faults, but they weren't there, there was no post-processing or automated processing for security events. So um, here at Internet2, we, were, we set up a, a Splunk environment and started getting uh, a, a copy of syslog from our devices and started looking at those for security purposes. And I'll, I'll show you, there's a little incident uh, coming up here that, that utilizes some of that data. Um, so we put in place a quarterly procedure to review the ACLs or firewall filters for our in-band management, at least until the management network is in place. 
those ankles had, had grown stale. Um, they hadn't been updated. It was, you know, they weren't causing a problem. Uh, but from a security perspective, there were some, some things being permitted that, that those systems or networks had been repurposed over time and it was no longer appropriate to leave, leave them in there. Um, we, we began credential scanning. So this was one of the things that for, for people doing vulnerability scanning for years, you know, you would typically just run a network scanner. It would connect to a service and tell you if it's vulnerable. Uh, credential scanning actually logs into the system or utilizes an agent on the system, one or the other, and then looks at the, the known vulnerabilities of all the onboard uh, software and configurations. So it's a much more thorough process. And so we, we began that on the NOC servers as well as on the routers. And that turned out to be very helpful. In fact, we've identified some uh, vulnerabilities in our current routers and uh, we're trying to, to figure out, based upon OpenFlow and some other operational requirements, uh, how we get to the next uh, release of Junos for us, since we're a Juniper shop, uh, that will address some of those uh, security vulnerabilities as well. Um, small things like ticketing of DDoS events uh, up till now, they actually have been seen as more resource problems. And so we just wanted to make sure we were targeting, or we were tracking them as security events uh, and and weren't, it's not that there are many, but if there was a connector or, or a member opened the ticket with a knock, we just wanted to make sure it was seen as a security ticket. Um, you know, ARP spoof monitoring and public exchanges, I'm not sure how important that was to do, but we put it in place. And then, of course, the incident response procedure was implemented, and that was critical. Some longer term improvements. Oh, um, Paul? Um, yes. Sorry, uh, one question. Um, Grace is asking, was Splunk implemented with the intent of performing full-scale log analysis on confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the security triad? Um, it's a good question. I don't know that I would... Uh, it, so it was put in place to, do, to, to review the logs from a security standpoint. And so it would certainly touch on uh, those elements of CIA uh, as they're reflected through log entries. You know, one of the things that, and, and we don't have time here, and it probably is, I was thinking about another uh, uh, topic down the road if we may try to write about, is, is the kind of logging that's available to you, you need to sync up with what you're going to start analyzing from a log standpoint. So there's more information that we could be logging, but we're not. And, um, and I think that would give us greater insight into some of those areas that, that she mentioned. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we just ran all of our network engineers here through uh, securing the human from SANS. This is a popular security awareness training program many universities have uh, picked up on. Of course, I mentioned we're doing security assessments. Uh, Periodically, uh, these are annual. Uh, we just completed one on third-party devices in the network, and uh, we're going to do another one. When I say third-party, these are devices in the network that are there as a result of a handshake agreement for a researcher or someone to place something in the network. Um, there aren't many of them, but uh, uh, we wanted to look at those. Uh, of course, the in the short term, it was uh, design an out-of-band network. <laughs> Longer term is to implement the out-of-band network, and that work is underway right now with, uh, uh, of course, Level 3 and ESNet uh, key partners of, of Internet 2s. Um, we've been trying to promote greater sort of adoption of, of routing security uh, methods, and uh, Grover and Carl have been doing a great job at leading this effort. Uh, we also have some uh, work underway within our own engineering and architecture teams to consider what we might be able to do to improve uh, routing without complicating uh, operations. We um, just recently put in place a procedure where someone requesting access to an Internet 2 colo site where they also have equipment uh, with us uh, that request comes now from an authorized requester of the organization. And so that's been um, 
that'll, that'll help a little bit. Not that we've had problems there, but it was a good check. Otherwise, the engineer you know, wanting access to the site uh, would ask us for access to the site. And so we just wanted to make sure that they were uh, authorized, uh, the work itself was authorized. And then we published a, last fall, a DDoS mitigation strategy. I included the link in the slide here to the blog entry. But it really is a sort of a three-pronged effort. Uh, and, and you can use any one of these, of course, but it would be commercial scrubbing. Uh, flow spec is something we hope to introduce into the network later this year. And then the real-time black hole is something that's been around for a while. And I'll, I'll talk about the commercial scrubbing in, in more detail. So here's a, here's a graph from Splunk. Um, this is you know, an NTP reflection uh, attack from a misconfigured router. So the firewall filter for NTP was, was mistyped on this particular device. And uh, you, know, you can see this was earlier this year, uh, June of, or sorry, February uh, 14th. And you can see starting around 8 a.m., we had a number of these events of send twos uh, from the router. And, and this was the NTP daemon trying to send uh, you know, the response to a monolith command to, to some IP for which there was no route to host. And uh, we just, it was an IP on the internet, but it wasn't in the routing table of that router since the RNE table is, is not the full routing table for the internet. And then the too many received buffs allocated was just a reflection of the, uh, the volume of these uh, messages. So this was, a, this was a good thing. I mean, this in some ways, um, you know, it, it's not that having a misconfigured router is a good thing, but what's a good thing about this is that we were able to catch it very quickly. Uh, and it was through this sort of Splunk analysis and uh, reporting that, we, that it was caught, the problem was fixed uh, correctly, or fixed promptly, I should say, and, and correctly, of course, and, and that was great. So that's a big success story. Um, something else that I, I find kind of fascinating with analyzing uh, syslog from our devices is that you get insight into traffic, uh, not necessarily attacking us, but just insight into other things that are going on on the internet. So you'll see that, that uh, Mirai, the, the uh, IoT uh, sort of uh, botnet that sprung up last fall, um, you know, it went after a couple of TCP ports. And, um, and you know, what, what's interesting about this is that you'll see that there was almost no activity through July, August, September uh, directed towards our devices on those ports. But, but apparently, the, you know, as, as some uh, group of people who knew what the code was doing, uh, they, started, they started scanning for those ports. And it didn't take long, about a month, before the source code itself was, was made generally public. And that's the Mirai source code uh, released. And of course, once that code was released, then more people were looking for those uh, ports. Um, but I just thought that was kind of an interesting sort of uh, signature of something that's going on related to, to broad security issues that we were able to sort of tease out with, uh, with syslog alone. So let me talk a little bit about the scrubbing service here. Um, I think you know if you've been part of the DDoS uh, working group with us, uh, there's nothing new here. And um, you know it's it's if 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 you haven't, um, I think it's fairly straightforward. I don't know that there's a lot. It's very complicated, so I might skim through this a little quickly. But the idea was that we wanted to have a volumetric uh, scrubbing service to um, deal with DDoS attacks in the network. And, and we were hearing this primarily from members and connectors. There was this broad call of what can we do. And so um, you know, we, we worked for about a year with a working group of approximately 100 people to develop a, an approach. And that approach uh, involved realizing that Internet2 itself doesn't want to run a scrubbing center. And if there was a way to leverage uh, a cloud-based scrubbing center, that would be the fastest way to get something going 
and would probably offer the highest value for people subscribing or members subscribing to it. So the, the idea here was really to, to find a service that would see us as a service provider and allow us to direct to them attack traffic to a member or number of members that was originating on any network. Uh, so this would protect, say, a campus from both commodity as well as R&E uh, traffic. And, um, and then we would carry the clean traffic back across the Internet 2 network to the, uh, to the site being attacked. And so the, the scrubbing service um, is, is sort of structured this way. It covers both V4, V6. Uh, there's an, and, and this is really what, you know, coming at this from a service provider standpoint is what's key is that it covers an unlimited uh, number of addresses. So there's no limit on prefixes. I don't know if you've looked at vendors in this space, but for cloud vendors in particular, they want to charge you based on how many prefixes um, that you're going to, uh, they're going to uh, protect for you. So this was key. And then we're using a layer three VPN uh, to return the, the uh, clean traffic and uh, really the signaling for the scrubbing service is done via, via BGP. And the, the provider Zen Edge has a SOC and the, the, if, you, if you come under attack, you signal that you want them to take over a particular prefix. They'll announce a, a more specific prefix covering the range being attacked and you can gain access to their SOC facilities and monitor the attack, get statistics and, and so on. Uh, from them. Um, the way we're, we're structuring it right now, and this is coming on board really this month, is we're going to have connections in both Ashburn and Los Angeles. Uh, subscribers will have access to the SOC in a, in a portal. And, and one of the unique features of our environment is that we sort of have this additional notion of a tenant, that is to say uh, an organization behind a subscriber. And, and the reason why this is important is if you think of, say, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with Michigan uh, because I'm still in Michigan, but if you think about uh, Merit being a regional network and, say, the University of Michigan being a uh, behind Merit, um, it might be the case that Merit wants to be a subscriber, but U of M says, you know, hey, we're big enough, we want to have our own access to the SOC and we want to have the clean traffic, uh, our clean traffic return directly to us they can sign up as a tenant and be behind merit. And so there's a business structure that allows that to, uh, to occur. The, um, you know, the way this would generally work uh, if it was just commodity traffic uh, is you have on the, on the left-hand side, uh, you know, a, a, a commodity internet, you have a scrubbing center up at the, at the top and, and when the subscriber or, or tenant, that is, come under attack, um, all of the commodity, uh, commodity traffic would be directed to the scrubbing center for ZenEdge. And then the clean traffic would come back on the right through Internet 2 to either the subscriber or the tenant. And uh, th this is kind of a, uh, you know, I, sh I should mention that this, is, this was something that we really had to have in place couldn't just protect against attacks within the RE network alone. We really wanted to have something that would defend against uh, these sort of commodity attacks because that's mostly where they're occurring from. But in the event that uh, RE becomes uh, sort of a source of these attacks and is perhaps attacking other universities, we wanted to have a model for that as well. And so the scrubbing center w has peered with our network not only for the return of clean traffic, but also to take in attack traffic should we have a case where a regional or, or member network is the source of a, of a volumetric DDoS attack. Um, that traffic would, would come across our network, stay within our network, go to the scrubbing center, and then the clean traffic return to the subscriber and, uh, or tenant. 
So um, that's kind of that's kind of it in a nutshell in terms of the DDoS service. We have more information on our website, and you know there are more details that we can provide uh, if you're interested. But this this really isn't you know it's trying to give more of a description of how it worked uh, as opposed to sort of a pitch of of how much it costs or how you get signed up or anything. So um, you know the thing I'm really pleased with here in my short tenure at Internet2 is that the leadership is, is committed to appropriately protecting the network. You know, we don't see security as, as some goal that everything has to be locked down. On the other hand, there's an acknowledgement that some changes have to be made in this uh, sort of time we find ourselves in. The improvements themselves have been a high priority uh, when balanced against other work, and there's no shortage of, of other work, <laughs> as you can imagine. So sometimes finding the right you know, mix of, of efforts uh, is, is, uh, is a struggle, but by and large, the security improvements um, have been making good progress. Um, and so we're hoping that when we're all done, you know, the network will be in a, in a better uh, place and that, that leadership will have felt as if they've had a chance to turn some knobs and get the security posture uh, to a place that they feel uh, comfortable with. And so with that, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yep. Uh, so uh, those of you in the audience, uh, please start typing. And while you guys are typing, I'll just uh, go over a couple of uh, details. Number one, um, please take our survey. Uh, we like to track your interest in these programs. We like to track uh, topics that you would like to hear more about or presenters. So please use the survey to give us some feedback about that. And then um, also, uh, let me just talk about next month's webinar. Um, our next webinar is August 28th at 11 a.m. And the topic is improving the security and usability of two-factor authentication for cyber infrastructure with uh, Nitesh Saxena and Stanislav Yurecki. And um, I will be sending out notifications to register for that webinar in a couple weeks. And it looks like we have our first question here from uh, Chester. Should Internet2 be in line through a university's broad border firewall? Should I2 be in line? Do you mean should, should Internet2's DMARC with the university be behind a border firewall? Um, if, if that's what you mean, I, I think that's a choice that a university can make. Um, you know, I, I guess from my standpoint, uh, Internet 2 still sees itself as a transit network. And one of the things that uh, we do is transit traffic that comes onto our network uh, that we, we do not believe is malicious. And we are not actively I suppose, trying to identify and separate malicious from non-malicious traffic. So I will say to you that a fair amount of traffic that crosses our network that's intended for campuses, I don't believe is necessarily associated with RNE or the traditional uh, peering service, commercial peering service that we established. So if, if, you know, my sense is that um, it would probably not be wise to drop an Internet 2 connection behind a border, border firewall, assuming that you have a clean pipe service that only has, uh, you know, uh, legit traffic on it. Okay, um, another question uh, coming in. Let's see. We've got some back and forth. Oh, wait. Okay. Uh, Scott, can you share any status or plans for collaboration on security incident response with international partners like Gent? Is that how you pronounce that? G-E-A-N-T? Gent. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's Europe after all. You know. <laughs> um. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so actually, yeah, we are. There's a, a global CEO forum that Internet2 participates in, and within that uh, group of global NRENs, there's a security working group, which I'm a member of, and Jayant is also a member, NordUnet, SurfNet, um, 
and I, I, I apologize, I don't know all of the others offhand. There's someone from South uh, Africa, uh, Australia, uh, Germany, uh, Brazil, Spain. Anyways, you get the idea. And we have several projects underway uh, where we are working collectively to uh, sort of solve some of these global issues. And incident response is one of the projects that is being worked on. And then we've got another question from uh, Grace. DDoS is one of the many threats in securing RE. The scrubbing component seeks to address availability. How different or similar from a local secure space is this solution of volumetric magnitude? Um. So I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Uh, how different or similar from a local secure space? So the, the, the problem, so let me, let me I, I think I understand what you're asking, which is if, if a campus or a regional had its own volumetric uh, solution or its own DDoS solution, how different is ours? And um, uh, in, in, in essence, I would say it's not. Um, we wanted to work closely with, with organizations that had already invested in scrubbing solutions. And by the way, we didn't, we didn't find too many uh, schools or regionals that had, in, had purchased cloud scrubbing solutions, uh, but we did find a number that had purchased appliances. And uh, we wanted to ensure that, that what we were doing complemented those um, you know, deployments. We didn't want to, to render those ineffective. And, and one of the things that, that the people that had deployed appliances, you know, mentioned pretty much across the board was that they had sized their units to fit a certain type or size of attack, um, but beyond that size, they were concerned that they couldn't respond. So one of the ways that this, our solution can, can work with that is that if you have, you already have deployed, um, you know, a set of appliances that can handle X uh, gigabits per second of, a, of attack traffic, you could, in essence, buy into this uh, Internet 2 service as a safety net or essentially as a, um, you know, a, 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 to gain some headroom so that if the attack uh, that you that was coming across your network was indeed using all of your bandwidth, which far exceeded what your appliance could use. You could still use the Internet 2 scrubbing service to help to deal with that. So it's a way of layering those uh, together. Um, we'll have to see how many organizations decide to do that. Um, you know, if you want to use our service as your front line, you could. If you wanted to use it as as merely a, a backup in case your primary service is overwhelmed, you could do that as well. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Looks like Grace is typing. Yep, she says it did. Great. Okay. Okay, so we also have a little bit of a discussion going on between Scott F. and um, Chester. So, um, so we went back to that question, should I2 be in line through a university's uh, border firewall? And, um, and then Scott F., uh, are you concerned about HPC environments which are moving large data sets and the small amount of overhead firewalls add to transmission? And then Chester says to Scott, I have been told that routing Internet 2 through the firewall would slow things down too much and should not be done. I am questioning. So mm -hmm. Scott, it looks like, also is uh, mid-response. <laughs> yeah. Okay, here we go. Uh, I hear that a lot from high-performance computing-related researchers and staff. It all comes down to architecture. I think most universities route everything through the border firewall and put some form of data transfer node on the outside. Yeah, I, I think there was an earlier presentation that, that uh, Michael Sinatra from ESNet gave a little while yep. back on. Uh, secure DMZ, 
And, and so that may be the kind of answer here is that when you have these science areas for which, uh, you know, throughput, low latency, high bandwidth, those are, are key factors, um, you know, those can still ride across the I2 network uh, without any problem, but, you know, the, the, the point of, of uh, you know, gateways and choke points and security architecture at a campus level potentially interfering with those yeah, that's a valid uh, concern, and so I would just point you at least uh, to, to that science DMZ notion, and ESNet has published quite a bit on, on their site. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it if you've looked, on how to architect something and see uh, science DMZ as more of a security architecture and a way to, to apply appropriate controls to, a, to a, just another segmented network. Yes. And uh, thank you for that plug. Uh, we we do have a, a webinar uh, about the Science DMZ. So if you, uh, um, Chester, if you go to trustedci.org slash webinars, you can look through our previous presentations and you'll see one by Mike Sinatra at ESNet. That might help uh, give you more background information on that. We've got only a couple minutes left. So uh, anyone want to provide any last minute questions? Um, while while there while people are typing, um, I just really want to thank you, Paul, for uh, providing this presentation to us, and um, we really appreciate the the uh, community that we're building in order to make every everyone's um, systems more secure. Um, just one last reminder to everyone who's attending: please uh, fill out the survey. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, Paul, uh, do you mind if uh, we <laughs> share some contact info, if people have follow-up questions about this presentation? Not at all. I'm happy to talk about it more. And I, I, I want to thank all of you for taking the time to, to attend today. And, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to get in front of you. I think these are important topics. Um, and I, you know, I, I think this all works better when we see it as a team effort. So, uh, so I'm excited to work with people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think with that, um, I just want to wrap things up and just say thanks again. And for those of you who are attending, the next webinar is on the 28th. Uh, be on the lookout for that. I will be sending out a, an email with the YouTube link to watch this video. It takes a little bit of time to get the slides archived, but once they are archived, I put them right up on our website. So if you have any questions about that, just check back at the site. And um, with that, I will stop recording.